Hello, 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 and welcome to this week's rendition of Tracy's Tuesday Talks. Now it's been a minute since I've been on, and I have an incredibly special guest with me, Caroline Kelly, who is a rock star of a coach. She is a financial coach, a life coach, and the name of her business is Fit Financial Coaching. And today we are bringing the topic to you right before the holidays, legal money schemes making you broke and how to be a smart consumer. So Caroline, introduce yourself and tell us about that letter that you sent that got us onto this topic. Thanks, Tracy. It's wonderful to be here. Um, you, it's great to be with a rock star coach. You are amazing and you're, and um, you are just an amazing um, person to be a part of this. Um, after financial coaching, what we do is we work with people, mostly individuals, parents, um, and families, also people facing divorce, dealing with their finances. So what got this going together was a conversation you and I had about a letter I received from my mortgage company who wanted to help me during this financial situation we're all going through to make my life a little easier. You are the only one in the entire country who's gotten this letter. I am sure I am the <laughs> only one they're going to help out here. And this is, this is, this was really the concern I had, right? Cause I was pretty emotional about this for about a week because I was angry knowing that this letter went out to millions of people dealing with their finances and having challenges in their life. And while I have a 15 year mortgage, they offered me a 30 year mortgage with about $75,000 of equity out of my home. And um, my interest rate was going to go from 2.5% to 6.2%. And for 30 years, I could sign up for a mortgage and save $3 a month instead of my 15, which my 15 is now 13. Right. And of course, we're paying it off a little faster. <laughs> so I could go for 13 years on my mortgage or I could take $75,000 out and I could pay for another, you know, 17 years for $3 less. Wow. Wow. Just, it's like these companies who send out these letters or have these marketing schemes, which by the way, for our audience, the definition of a scheme, because we are using it in the proper context, is a large-scale systemic plan or arrangement for attending a particular object or putting a particular idea into effect. A large-scale systemic plan or arrangement for, oh, excuse me, attaining, excuse me, attaining a particular object or putting a particular idea into effect. So the idea behind these schemes is to make them rich yeah. and people broke. Right. But are also letting you feel like they're helping you. Right. That's how they get you. They think yes. that they make you believe that they're doing you a favor when mm -hmm. in fact they are damaging your long-term wealth. And an, a great example of this is not only those mortgage letters that you get, which I get probably about six of those a week mm -hmm. on a, on an easy week. I get like three or four a day. Sometimes the public student loan forgiveness programs, we're going to hit this nail right on the head and tick off a lot of people right now, but we <laughs> want this information to be out there and to help you think for yourself, whether or not it's a good idea. So Caroline, run us through what the public student loan forgiveness program is. So the public student loan forgiveness program is a program that allows individuals to work in public service. So mostly um, in their community and over a period of time, they can go ahead and get their student loans forgiven. Um, I believe it was a 20 year program. Now it's a 10 year program, right? 10, 10 it was years. 20. Now it's 10 at yeah. the current moment. There's a projection of 10 years, right? Um, to allow people to forgive their student loans. Uh, there's a lot of guidelines to this. So people think, oh, I'm just going to do that. And then they 
don't realize there's some fine print, right? A lot of fine prints, a lot of fine prints. A lot, a lot of fine print involved in that, right? And then what happens is, is you are now locking yourself into a career that you may not for the next 20 years. And that's great to have a career for 20 years. You know, you and I've talked, I had a career before I retired for t- over 20 years. I retired early, right from it. That's great to have that and to serve our community. I, I definitely love that from people. But the problem is, is the long-term cost of this. And the long-term cost of this is really, as I look with people who have this, I say to them, what would it be for you to go get private sector work pay off your student loans. And in tw- the 20 year period, now that's gone down to 10, but the 20 year period, right? When you look at how much of a salary difference an individual's taking, it's usually more than what the student loan was. Yes. And I've had, I've had clients and consultations with people who are all excited about getting their student loans forgiven through this program, not realizing that A, They have to make 120 payments on time, not being late in full for the 10 year program. They have to be part of a uh, agreed upon uh, nonprofits or public service agency. They Mm -hmm. cannot work in the private sector to make more money. And usually those jobs more often than not, because it's public service, pay you a lot less. So a perfect example would be inner city teachers. And the example that you talked about earlier, nurses who decide to work for a specific agency making peanuts compared to what they could be elsewhere. And now this number is rising up because this this program's gotten a lot of heat lately, but only about 2% of people qualify this program for this program and you have to apply for it after being a perfect little angel for 10 years paying under loans and you're still paying 120 payments so you're still paying on this loan Mm -hmm. and not only that but I've had people say that because they were getting for this program for this forgiveness the interest has been racking up because their minimum payments are not even covering the interest on it. So they owe more now after paying on these suckers for 10 years than they did for what they took the loan out for originally when it could have been paid off in three, five, less than 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a nurse that's working and they're working hard and and listen, I believe in, in, in public service. I worked in public service for a long time. I didn't do it because I had student loans and was trying to get rid of that. I did that for another reason, right? So I believe in that completely. But the thing is, is if you have a nurse that has a huge student loan debt, becoming a traveling nurse for two years will clear your student loan debt. And now you can live the rest of your life. And if you want to go to public service, go for it. Now, Now you can afford it and you don't have this debt hanging over you. Yeah. So there's ways to do this as a consumer that's better for you. And sometimes these angles that you're hearing and seeing and 99.9% of the time, these angles really are not in your best interest. These are the best interests of the company selling you or providing you the product or providing you the service. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but I don't want to give 10 years of my life and how I live my life. Yeah. to a government program that may potentially possibly yeah. hurt a student loan. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing is, is when you come in as a consumer looking at this, you have to look at 2%. That, is this going to be your situation? And don't forget student loan forgiveness program. Anything they forgive is taxable income on capital gains for you. So, so that means that when they do forgive it, at a hundred thousand or seventy five thousand or fifty thousand that's added that year to your taxes and you've got to pay the taxes on that money. Yeah. And if you've been working at it in a way that you weren't able to do that, you still you've been paying 120 months. Now you've got to pay the difference off in taxes. So while you get a reduction, it's not a true forgiveness because they're not forgiving the whole entire loan for your service. They're forgiving a portion of the loan 
that sometimes if we look at it, doesn't balance to the difference of what you could have been making and paying it off on your own. Mm -hmm. I find, and I know we've talked about this before, that people we work with are the best champions for their life and their money. Yes. And that's what being a really good consumer is. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Being a champion for your life and your money. Yeah. Mm. Amen to that. Mic drop. Boom. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some other schemes that are legal that make you broke? Well, we've got a few of them, right? There's some sales tactics out there. So we've all been up late night, not sleeping and seeing the commercial for lose weight and, and make money, right? My, my husband looked at that because he didn't see the fine print. He's like, how do they make money losing weight? Well, you have to pay into that. And then there's a program, right? And then you get some money back. So people have made $2,800, but they had to pay $1,600, $1,800 to go into a program to do that. And if they make it, then they get their money back. So, so there's a true aspect to this. So what you're saying is, is the money is supposed to be that you pay into it is the incentive. And y'all, I have fur babies that are my children and my basset hound is acting like a toddler. So forgive me. No, this is real. (laughs) This is real life. You're perfectly fine. Real talk. Real talk. So the incentive as it were is you pay, Mm -hmm. let's just say a thousand bucks and you say that you're going to lose 50 pounds. Yeah. In a set period of time. If you don't lose that 50 pounds in a set period of time or however much, mm-hmm. you don't get your money. Don't but, get your money. But supposedly, if you do, then you get $1,600 or however much the pot is. Right. Y'all. So, what you're doing is gambling that you're going to lose weight. Not all. Yeah, exactly. It's a lottery ticket. Yeah. It's a lottery ticket. And y'all, let's do some simple math. What's 1600 minus a thousand? 600 bucks. So think about that as how are they playing to your emotions? And, and please read the fine print. Mm-hmm. Please read the fine print. Mm-hmm. Another marketing scheme that we run into as coaches is the reverse mortgage. Do you want to, do you want to explain this one, Carolyn, or would you like me to? You go ahead. I got, Hey, you got me in public student loan forgiveness. I'm going to sit back and listen to you talk about this one. Cause I know reverse mortgage is a big one for you too. Especially. It, 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 it raises my hackle. So a, re- a reverse mortgage is as it sounds, it's a reverse mortgage. So a mortgage is when you buy a house, you're borrowing the bank's money to get the house and you pay the bank back in a reverse mortgage you give your your house essentially to the bank Mm -hmm. and then they give you a monthly stipend or payment or whatever so basically um this is this is oh this ticks me off the most this is targeted at people who are age 62 years or older So it's specifically targeting the elderly and it is, it's basically preached at as a means to stay in your house when you're older and you're having financial troubles. Mm -hmm. So you are literally, you're giving your house to the bank. They're paying you a monthly fee. Like instead of what you would pay them, they pay you for it. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, guys. At the end of of a reverse mortgage, the bank gets to keep your house. At the end of the reverse mortgage, the bank keeps your house. Unless you have the entire value of what the house is worth to give back to the bank. Mm -hmm. You have to buy your house back. You Mm -hmm. have to buy your house back, which the reason why you would be in a reverse mortgage to begin with is because you were strapped financially anyway. And if you still owe on the house when you die, either the house gets the house, the bank gets to keep your house, 
or your beneficiaries have to pay the bank to be able to keep the house. Yeah. And this is a big one when we talk about thinking ahead, right? Thinking down the road um, is if you get a reverse mortgage for $500,000 on your home and the market plummets, we've seen that a few times, right? The market plummets when and you pass and your house is only worth $350,000. Now there is a $150,000 difference on the home. And because of that, you're, you're in people who would inherit your estate or would either, it would take away everything else. And then anything left over there, your estate's responsible for. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a big one. It's, it's, again, it's almost a gamble on that, right? What's this looking like? Um, and what, what are you trying to do? Oh, cash out your things. Um, a great option for this that I talked to a lot of people about is downsizing in your home. You know, if you want, if you want to take equity out of your house and your family's grown and the yard's too much or anything like that's happening, what does this next season of your life look like? We really need to start going away from those emotions of, oh, fix it real quick and it'll be okay. Because it's not, what does it look like for your next season? Are you going to be traveling and you just want to have a nice townhouse and that's great for you? Do you want to keep the family home? Maybe you do. Maybe it is sold to a leg someone in the legacy of your family and you have something that's more beneficial for you for what you need. Yeah. There's lots of options for people out there rather than what they feel will be a quick fix. Mm -hmm. And so many people try to get that quick fix. Yeah. And speaking of quick fixes, our next one, refinancing and home equity lines of credit. Oh yeah. HELOCs. They're great. Yep. Throw the arms in there too. Cause have you seen lately arms are coming back? Arms, adjustable rate mortgages. Yes, mm -hmm. I have. Adjustable yes, I have. rate mortgages. And in, in the article I, I was looking at said adjustable rate mortgages return, but they're not the same as they used to be. <laughs> How are they different? Please tell. There was nothing in the article that explained that to me. <laughs> <laughs> because the market is still up, I guess. I don't know. So yeah. yeah. So let's talk about these. So uh, HELOCs, borrowing on your home. On the equity of your home. On the equity of your home. The letters that I get from mortgage companies, um, I won't name them. <clears throat> yeah, let's not do that, please. <laughs> several. Yeah, I don't want to get sued because um, they probably would. Mm -hmm. They say, take the equity out of your home to pay off debt. Really? That's just transferring debt mm -hmm. to give yourself the kitchen you've always dreamed about to put money in the bank and savings. What, what people don't understand is a home equity line of credit is essentially a second mortgage on your house. And I say that because, and I've had clients have these who wanted to move, but they couldn't because they had a 14, 15, $20,000 home equity line of credit that they were underwater on. They had to pay that off before they could sell their house. Correct. So if you take it, if your home has a value, again, we, we went through this example before with the reverse mortgage. If your home has a value of a half a million dollars and let's say you owe a hundred thousand, so you have 400,000 in equity in your home. If you borrow that money, of course, you've got to pay it back. So your mortgage now increases. But if you have to pay that back, what happens is, is if your house goes down to that 350 again, and you, you have to pay back the difference. You sell your house at 350, yeah, you have $250,000 to throw at this loan, but the difference has to be paid back to the bank at the time of the sale of the home. It's not, you either have to go get another loan and start paying that off, but then let's see, where is the consumer at? The consumer doesn't have a house. The consumer doesn't have a down payment for the next house, right? So you're renting you're you're going into a rental issue here so you're really seeing the value the, the devaluing of your, your assets when you deal with this and not only that but the interest rates on these HELOCs is insane they are it is it, it's 
14, 15% from, I, I just had a conversation with a lady. She's like, yeah, I'm just going to use my home equity line of credit to pay off my credit cards and then take out another home equity line of credit and pay off this other debt. And it's just like, you're falling into a vicious cycle mm -hmm. of using your house as a bank when that should be your largest investment to mm -hmm. build wealth. Right. And, and that's a big part of this, right? It, um, the, the biggest thing that they see with millionaires is that millionaires a lot have assets in their retirement in their home value. That's like the biggest three fourths of someone's equity. Sometimes the whole entire thing can put you in millionaire status. So people who want to be millionaires, the truth about that is that's where it is. It's not just this big nest ball of, of money somewhere. Your net worth is, you know, what you owe over what you own. So when you're looking at this and you're going into these things, it really makes you want to say, Hey, wait a minute here. Yeah. We, uh, you know, arms, arms are again, just a adjustable rate mortgage, which means now you let the bank just change your, change your rates. So for five years, it's locked in at 1%, but after five years, it can go up to 17. You know, they, they send you a letter saying, Oh, wait a minute, your adjustable rate now is, you know, 17, 18%, 15%, 11%, whatever that would be. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So and what we teach is if you want to get rid of those credit card debts, if you want to just have that nice kitchen, if you want to have the money for that project, follow the seven baby steps. Yeah. Use the debt snowball because mm -hmm. that way you're not leveraging your house, your home. If you need to move suddenly because stuff hit the fan and you need to get out, been there, done that. It sucks. And you can't because you're upside down on your house because of home equity lines of credit. You're stuck. So the way to get out of debt is using that debt snowball method. And Carolyn and I would be more than happy and excited to share with you more about that. I've done a Tracy's Tuesday talk on that. Look that up on YouTube. And what more do you have to say on the home equity lines of credit arms? I think that there's, of course, as coaches, we deal with 80% behavior, 20% numbers, right? And as you were talking about people doing HELOCs, arms, things like this, these types of things of borrowing the equity in your home to pay your credit cards off, to pay this off, what you're not doing is you're not addressing the behavior. And so how many times have you worked with someone? I just had someone the other day that I was talking to, they, they got a loan to pay off their credit cards, they max their credit cards out again because they didn't correct the behavior. They did it three times. Now they have three loans to pay off and their credit cards are maxed out on the fourth time. On the fourth time, they've now said, listen, we need to stop this. We need to stop this behavior. Something has to change. And now you're sinking into more and more debt. So it takes longer to get out of, but it's doable. This is a doable situation. And we work with it every single day, right? Yeah. So I think that that's a big part of this is when you're starting to take money out of your assets for liquid situations, you really got to look at that and say, you know, are you really going to change that behavior or are you just trying to erase a problem real quick and hope that it gets better down the road? Because if you don't change the behavior, you're going to keep getting what you're getting if you do what you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's a big, I think that's a big one to address on that behavior end of this is, is we're seeing how people are doing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. And lastly, speaking yeah. of behavior, I want to get into credit card rewards. Oh, yeah. That's the biggest, probably one of the biggest ones that we have, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I have had conversations with many people who are like, why should I stop using my credit card? I get rewarded for using it. I get cash back or I get airline miles or I get points to get gift cards or whatever it is. What I is know. the true opportunity cost of those points? That's what we go into with our clients, right, Tracy? is what is the true opportunity cost? I had a lady, she's like, oh my gosh, I've got like 2,500 points. And we were able to go down for a weekend um, 
in North Carolina. She's in New York. I love her. And we started to talk about it. And she pays $950 a year for the right to have the card. That's your vacation right there. (laughs) Right. So as we dug deeper into how much she has to spend to get points, plus we add on the cost of the actual annual fees of these cards that start low and then they move up as they've got you in the behavior of this, right? Yeah. Um, as we started to look at that, she was paying the bank for the points. She wasn't getting anything really because if she missed a month and there was interest on it. So we went back a whole entire year and looked at how much interest she's paying on these purchases. We looked at what was going on for the annual fees and we were looking through this. And as I'm just, as we're looking through it, her face is just like the realization of what the true cost. So what is the true cost of your points? And that's a really good examination you can have. You can reach out to a coach like you and I, where we can sit with you and like give you a non-judgmental view and an accountability. So you don't just kind of like, that's one thing we do as people, right? We just kind of like justify it. Yeah. But when we really look at the true cost of this, yeah, you get to see what's happening here. And for those who like to put out there, well, I pay off my credit card in full at the end of every month. I never carry a balance. I want to share with y'all some interesting statistics. Ooh, I love statistics. I love when you pull statistics out. Go on, all right. I love psychology. I'm, I'm one of those coaches. Like I had a consultation today and the dude was sort of really like, this feels just like marriage counseling. And I'm just like, Hey, welcome to coaching. <laughs> the psychology and statistics of credit cards, guys, look at their buildings. The biggest skyscrapers that you're going to see in any big city is going to have a big old bank name on it. Mm-hmm. They get their money out of you. They know that because you're using their money and not yours, when you go to swipe that cart, you are not going to have the pain sensors of your brain light up. Well, of course I don't want the pain sensors of my brain lit up, I don't like pain. There is a psychological response when you hand over cash because that cash is a symbol of the time that you spent putting into a job or into work and you tangibly feel that exchange of cash for an item. When you swipe a card, that is not there. It shows it on brain scans, it doesn't exist. So even though you are paying off your credit card in full every month, every transaction that you spend at the grocery store, that you spend shopping, that you spend out on entertainments, you are spending between 13 and 18% more per transaction. So if you have an average of paying 2000 bucks a month on your credit card, because you pay all your bills, you do all your shopping on your credit card, and it comes out to $2,000 per month, we'll do an average of that 15%, that 15 between the 13 and the 18% that you spend more you are overspending by $350 per month. You are spending an additional $4,200 per year just by using a credit card. Correct. And the transaction fees that the, that the retailer is paying for you to use your card is reflected in your sale price of your item that you're purchasing. So those are things that are rolled. It, 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 you know, it all rolls down to the consumer. And I think a big part of this and a great challenge for people who are watching this is to take one week out of their life and just put the credit card to the side for a minute and use a little bit of cash along the way, not on the big, not on everything, but look at some things, food, eating out, you know, those are the big ones, right? Yeah. Um, Maybe if you're spending in a certain category that you're kind of like, oh, that that's really taking over my budget. Just in two or three categories, use that cash and see where that's going. Because what's happening is, is you're paying a credit card bill of $2,000. 
but you're not seeing where that money's going. And then people say, hey, last year I made X amount of dollars. I don't know where my money's going. Intentionality when it comes to your money is so important. It doesn't mean that you can't go out to dinner or you and your um, significant other or a date or anything can't go on a date or you can't go out with the friends on Friday night. What it means is there's a value to doing this. And what does this look like for you? Yeah. I had a conversation with a lady who, I don't know if she still works for American Express, but she said that she worked for American Express. And when she realized that they were spending more than they were bringing in each month, she decided yeah. to stop using the credit card because that was a new thing. That was a new habit that they picked up. And she's like, I immediately felt the difference from using a credit card to a debit card in cash. Yeah. And we see it in our clients in how much they're spending because they all of a sudden have a weight of the purchase. They feel the weight of their purchase right then and there. You don't feel the weight of a purchase when you lump it together like that until that time comes that you're overspending your income or something happens and you have to, you get sick and can't work or your income can't come in or God forbid things that I see a lot, um, a marriage breaks up, right? And that now you're from two incomes to one income and you have a whole behavior change on top of a behavior change, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things like that that are happening. Yeah. So life happens. It's always going to happen and it can happen to you and you have to be, you know, you have to respond to it or react to it. If you want to be reactive to everything as it's coming at you, there's a lot of anxiety and stress in that. Being responsive to your life is calmer. You and I are calm people because we're responsive to our lives, right? And we, we help show people that. Yeah. But you can be responsive to your life and you can enjoy life. That's not saying you can't. But being reactive to life means there's a bigger payout at the end. Yeah. And a lot of that is your mental and your emotional health. Not Correct. A mental and physical health too. Because mental, emotional, and physical can happen, right? Yeah. 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 So ask yourself, when you come across any of these, we, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about public student loan forgiveness programs, talked about reverse mortgages. We talked about those losing weight for money schemes, scams, whatever it is, credit card rewards, reverse mortgages. Anytime that there is a program that has to do with money, ask yourself, how do they make their money? What's the fine print? And what is the cost of this long term? Wealthy people ask how much. Broke people ask how much is the payment. I agree completely. It's more beautifully said, how much is this going to cost me? Yes. So, Caroline, thank you so much for joining. If people want to get a hold of you, what's your contact information? My con um, they can reach out to me at coachcarolineaz at gmail.com would be my great email address to reach out to me with questions. Um, and then that would probably be the best way to find it, find me as far as uh, reaching out. So Coach Caroline, C-O-A-C-H-C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E, A-Z -A as in Arizona, yes. at gmail.com. Gmail okay, awesome. And okay. as always, um, thank you for joining us. If you want to reach out, please give me a call, text, or an email, or drop a message in the uh, chat box for this as well. I'd love to come alongside of you. And if you feel like that you are sick and tired of having schemes manipulate you and you feel like you can't get ahead in your finances, please reach out. I'd love to have a conversation with you. It'd be a great conversation for them to have. That's for sure. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, thank you so much and have a blessed day, guys.